not touching all the way marks, but to some of the way marks. We identified the three primary way marks at the beginning. The first being where a divine principle comes down and empowers it. After this, it's the fourth way mark. We've identified that the fourth way mark, which here at the end of the world is expressed as Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That the fourth way mark is a repeat of the second way mark, which is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The characteristics of the second way mark, Babylon is fallen, will be the same as the characteristics as the fourth way mark, Babylon is fallen. And therefore, because the second way mark is preceded by the first step, the fourth will be preceded by the first way mark, and also followed by the third way mark in each of these histories. From a quote from 1888 materials that is in your notes, Sister White says that the first and second angel's messages are still present truth for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. We mark that the first angel's message comes into history in 1798. It increases in knowledge, or as Jamal read in one of the last quotes, another example of the increase of knowledge is the advancing glory. These are two expressions to emphasize that the prophetic light that is unsealed at the time of the end in each of these histories, it escalates and increases until the end of this history here. The history of the first and second angel's message is to parallel the third, because this is that the first and second angel's messages are still present truth for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. That which follows the second angel's message is the third angel's message. So when we run a parallel of the third angel's message, that parallel will parallel the history of the first and second angel's message. So it will have a time at the end. It will have a way mark, which the divine symbol comes down. This way mark will be a conviction of sin message, just as this message was. And this way mark that is paralleling this is nothing more than this way mark here. We are taking this history here and placing it here in order to make it run parallel. Therefore, the fourth, which is a type of the second, is here. And the third is here. We mark um, <clears throat> some place, the one place that sometimes is confusing to some is that uh, we, where, what, how we identify the loud cry. The loud cry is the loud cry of the third angel. And we, we mark the loud cry sometimes as Revelation, the angel of Revelation 18, and just leave it there in midair. Um, when Sister White told us that the loud cry of the third angel began in 1888 with the message of Jones and Wagner. Therefore, that lets us know that even though the loud cry of the third angel is marked in Revelation 18 here at the end of the world, it was already marked in 1888, so if you're going to be accurate to the loud cry, the loud cry of the third angel began back here in 1844 when the third angel's message arrived in history because Sister White plainly tells us that the loud cry represents an increase of power. It arrived in 1844 and has been increasing in power <coughs> since that time. So at any time you want to say, since 1844, the loud cry of the third angel's message, you can do so. And if there is a general application to what the loud cry is, right? But there is a specific application to the loud cry, because we know this history right here, the midnight cry takes place. When it empowers the second way mark. So specifically, the loud cry takes place here after it joins and empowers the, this message here, this way mark. The midnight cry joined the second angel's message, it empowered it, and the second angel's message is marking when the Protestants of the United States close their doors against the message. 
paralleling its history is marking when the Protestants of the United States closed their doors at the Sunday Law, and this is empowered by the technical loud crowd, right? But, as Jamal so aptly demonstrated, I hope that you all saw that from a variety of arguments. This history here, from 1840 to 1844, is an illustration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this it's outpouring, this sprinkling, as paralleled with Christ breathing upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost, the dews that precede the full outpouring here of the loud cry began on September 11th, 2001. The latter rain begins to sprinkle. The only way that the latter rain is received is if we send our sins beforehand to judgment that they may be blotted out according to Acts chapter 3. Therefore, if this is the time period that we are in, then we are now at the point in judgment where Christ is blotting out people's sins, and therefore we are in the judgment of the living. And judgment begins at the house of God. And judgment begins here in this history upon Adventism. And at the Sunday law, the judgment of Adventism concludes and it moves outside of Adventism to the 11th hour workers. This is what the pattern illustrates. And this is the pattern that we have been dealing with for several years now. And there has been some, some corrections and some fine tunings. I'm not denying that. Um, but now if you turn to page 143 of your notes, you try to reach back into last night's presentation and remember some of the things that we dealt with. Um, you, we'll start with the quote we've read a couple of times, I think. The fifth chapter of Revelation needs to be closely studied. It is of great importance to those who shall act a part in the work of God for these last days. There are some who are deceived. They do not realize what is coming on the earth. And the fifth chapter of Revelation is the chapter we've dealt with um, in terms of Christ taking the book that is sealed with seven seals and beginning to open them one by one. Something that I hope that I can convey here, uh, that one, of the, one of the concepts that I, I'm wanting you to see here, is that in this sacred history, at the, the time of the end, when there's an increase of knowledge, the story of the increase of knowledge is a story about an escalation of life. Right? It increases. And we know that from Daniel 12 and other lines of prophecy, that that increase of light tests that generation. How that generation responds to this unfolding light is, is a test for them. And not only is it a test, it is the everlasting gospel, because when you get to the conclusion of the testing process, the two classes are fully illustrated. October 22nd, 1844. 49,950 stayed in the holy place with Satan and 50 moved into the most holy place with Christ. This is a, uh, the light that is increasing here is the advancing glory. It's more and more. So there's, there's themes in prophecy that when it comes to this history, there's more than one line that is emphasizing how this light advances. And one of the most important in my mind, Things to recognize that the, that the Spirit is using about the advancing, increasing light is here in chapter 5 and onward in the book of Revelation. In 1798, the book of Daniel is unsealed, but simultaneously, Christ, the line of the tribe of Judah, takes one seal. Then he takes the next seal. Then he takes the next seal. So the unsealing is another illustration of escalating light, increasing light. When you get to 1844, the seventh seal is opened. That's why the, the book is fully opened in 1844. So 
The unsealing, among well, there's many truths connected to the unsealing, but one of them is, it's just emphasizing this escalation of light, all right? Let's read this, um, this quote on, on 143. We asked John what he saw and heard in vision at Patmos, and he answers, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. thereon. There in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's providences, the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal, and the history of all ruling powers and the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of earth's history to its close. The roll was written within and without. John said, I wept much, because no man was worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. The vision, as presented to John, made its impression upon his mind. The destiny of every nation was contained in that book. John was distressed at the utter inability of any human being or angelic intelligence to read the words or even to look thereon. Now remember, what we're saying here is that John is representing himself in terms of Advent history as desiring to understand this book in 1798, and then he's told that Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, is the one that has been found worthy to open this book, and he begins to open it. In 1798 is the conclusion of the scattered. So when we're, we're understanding this history is repeating. After 1844, the great truths that had the Lord had used William Miller to assemble that are represented on this church, chart, chart, these great truths that are gathered together into this casket that's 10 by 6 by 6, they become scattered and buried. But by the end of William Miller's journey, William Miller is here weeping for the same situation that John is weeping. No one can understand this book because it's covered up with rubbish and sealed up by customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. So when the dirt brush man comes in in our history and begins to unseal the seven seals, it's paralleling this history right here. All right, um, we're we're now have watching the rubbish being swept out of the mouth, it's out of the window. Um, last paragraph. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under this altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given every one of them. They were pronounced pure and holy. And it was said unto them that they should rest a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Here... Here were scenes presented to John that were not in reality, but that would, which would be in a period of time in the future. And when he opened the seventh seal in the silence in heaven about a space of a half an hour, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and it was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense which came up, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. A couple things I want to say here that we're going to try to um, put in, in place so you can follow this presentation is that the first four seals parallel the first four churches. They're, re they're acting upon um, repeat and march. The, the white horse of the first seal is a symbol of the history of Ephesus. The red horse of the second seal is a symbol of the history of Smyrna, the history. One is the internal history of the church. One is the external history of the church, the Rice Smith said. But when we get to the, the fifth seal, we notice there's a, a purposeful break in the structure of Revelation. 
Um, the fifth and sixth, seventh seal are not beasts. There isn't a call to come and see for the beast in these seals. James White points this out. We pointed out last night that although it's not kindly seen at the surface on the seven churches, that there is a 4 3 break even in the churches because, in one sense, the experience of Smyrna, or the experience of Sardis, Laodicea, and Philadelphia are all contemporary. And we know that there's a far 4 3 break in the trumpets, so the last three trumpets are three woes. Those aren't in there on accident. The Lord is purposely trying to make a distinction for us. And what I'm going to suggest to you here is that at least one of the truths connected with the fifth and sixth and seventh seal is that they are not progressive history. They are teaching truths or lessons. And I don't know if, it, if there is a better way to convey this, but they are, they are identifying concepts, truths, Points that we are to understand, but they are not necessary. They're not necessarily to be understood as sequential history. All right, and you will find. I'll give you a problem with that if you if you want to apply that that way. If you're familiar with the sixth seal, the sixth seal begins with the the phenomenon in the sun, the moon, and the falling of the stars. So it takes you back to at least 1780. All right, it takes you back to 1780 for the dark day. Correct. So if you're going to do sequential history with the sixth seal, you're taking the sixth seal all the way back to the history of the fourth seal and the fifth seals in between. So just, there's, a, there's a rub there if you're going to do it. And the sixth seal takes you all the way to the wrath of God. So an 18-year overlap. Yeah, 18-year yeah, overlap and all of the fifth seal. And the whole sixth you, you, I'm taking from the sixth seal all the way back in the history of the fourth seal. Um, and, and, I, and we read the quote, the reason I just read this long quote is because Sister White plainly tells us about the fifth seal. She places it at Revelation 18. Okay? She jumps it all the way down to Revelation 18. So, in any case, um, next quote. When the fifth seal was opened, John the Revelator in vision saw beneath the altar the company that was slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Christ. After this, what comes after the fifth seal? Okay, the sixth seal. If it's sequential history, what comes after the fifth seal is the sixth seal. But that isn't what Sister White's going to say. She says, after this came the scenes described in the 18th of Revelation, when those who are faithful and true are called out of Babylon, Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5, and that's the second place. If you flip back to the page we just left, on the bottom paragraph, the last sentence, after she quotes the fifth seal, she says, Here were scenes presented to John that were in reality, but, would, but that which would be in a period of time in the future. Sister White saying the fifth seal is to be understand, understood in the history of Revelation 18. So, if, if you're going to hold to a sequential history of the 5th and the 6th and the 7th seal, there are many problems with that, unless you're just taking a, a general view, as we have typically done in the past. And I don't think we need to do that. Um, so, when we're go I, I just want to... What I'm trying to put in place here is that I'm not approaching the seals here as sequential history as the seven churches are from beginning to end. I'm saying that the first four seals are definitely sequential history, but when it comes to the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal, they're not to be understood that way. They're teaching truths. Right? They're teaching truths. One of the one of the reasons that we must see this, I believe, is because we're going to try to demonstrate when the seventh seal is open, and uh, we typically have no problem understanding that it's open in 1844, but we're going to try to show you that it's open three times. And if you're going to hit, I said, in one single point in history, because you're applying the seal sequentially, then there's no way that you're going to be able to place it in three different histories that I can see. In any case, let's, let's consider... Revelation 8, verses 1 through 6, which is Christ's intercessory scene. This is where he is doing the work of intercession. And I'm going to suggest that there is probably six different things that are identified in here, and that there is no way um, 
that we can deal with all of them. And I don't intend to, I never have. So in your notes, verses 1 and 2, it says, And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. That's one of the issues in the opening of the seventh seal, is the silence in heaven for a half an hour. What is the silence in heaven? Um, I'll tell you up front, I'm, I have some thoughts on that, but I'm, I do not think that I understand that fully. I have some thoughts. I'm not going to try to be dogmatic about that. But that's one of the things that's in the, involved with the opening of the seventh seal. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So when the seventh seal is open, you see the angels that are given seven trumpets, and of course we know the seven trumpets are the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. The first four trumpets represent the providential forces that bring down Western Rome by 476. Fifth and sixth trumpet are Islam. Seventh trumpet is the third world. So, but in the opening of the seventh seal, which we traditionally understand took place in 1844, is Christ is being portrayed of opening this final seal from the book that was in the Father's hand in in connection with his work there in the intercessory scene, the seven angels are there. So we're supposed to understand something about those seven angels in conjunction with his intercessory work. Let's look at another issue in these verses, verses 3 through 5. And another angel <coughs> Fire and prayer. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came up, came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and an earthquake. So, it would be nice to be clear on what the voices, the lightnings, the thunder, and the earthquake were that go on in there, because we know for certain they mean something. That's, that's another issue. And we're seeing here most definitely the intercessory work, the prayer, and Christ's response to the prayer. So let's, let's consider that before we move into the actual, what's represented by the opening of the seventh seal. What I'm suggesting is, is that more than just a, a, a portrayal of our moment by moment, day by day prayer life with Christ, that the prayer life that's being identified here are the prayers of the thing, saints that have to do with the specific work of Christ. This is, this is about the work of Christ more than it is about um, our individual prayers. But our individual prayers are definitely a component of it, but it's, it's a description of what he accomplishes, and more importantly, it's a description of what he accomplishes at least in these sacred histories that we've been dealing with. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear and heal their land. In these particular reform movements, um, one of the things that has to take place in order for God, not, I'll say it that way, even though it might be a little bit stunning or something, but one of the things that has to take place, God's people have to ask for forgiveness and ask for him to do this work. Um, and then he will do it. It's not like it's up to us, though. I don't think that God is going to go his history in these circumstances. And this is why Zechariah 10.1 needs to be understood by us here today. If we are saying amen to the idea that September 11, 2001 is our sign, and it is, and that it marks the beginning of the latter rain, then we have a command here in Zechariah 10.1 that we are to pray for the latter rain. <coughs> Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. To everyone, grass in the field. Um, let's have one, one, um, or two verses along with that that are in your Turn to Isaiah 55. I like this verse. Isaiah 55. 
verse 10. I'm sure you like these verses too. For as the rain, Isaiah 55 verse 10 says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not to the earth, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein to I send it. Amen. If we will pray for him, for the latter rain, in the time of the latter rain, he will open his word to us, because the latter rain is the messages that he sends us. The golden oil are the messages that are brought down through the two pipes. And the two pipes in the book of Zechariah, what were the two pipes for the Millerites in their reform movement? Not with the charts. That's that's kind of an obscure but accurate. But that's not. I don't want. To, that's not what I'm looking for. We actually have an article submitted for our newsletter that demonstrates that. Oh, not the the two pipes are the old and the New Testament. Okay, that's that's the two pipes that the golden oil, the messages, were conveyed to God's people in the Millerite history. The old and New Testament, right? That's. Zechariah is, is repeated in Revelation 11. We know the two witnesses in Revelation 11 are the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the earth, and that's the Old and New Testament. If you understand that, say amen. amen. So, so what are the two pipes for us at the end of the world? No. No. The two pipes for us at the end of the world are the in the spirit of prophecy. Because our casket is larger than William Miller's casket, right? Okay, so we're, but there's still two fights. Quick, I make quick because I'm running myself out of time. In verse 8, just before that, in Isaiah 55, it says, For my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We are your ways than my ways. Would this have anything to do with his word and what he's trying to convey to us? His thoughts and his ways? Yeah. Christ is God's thoughts. Amen. Anyway, I'm getting this off the subject. Select the messages, book 1, page 121. The Bible, the true God in us among us, is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs to seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them than ask than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant his blessing. The revival be, be expected only in answer to prayer. What I want you to see here, if you will, is we're dealing with the intercessory scene, Revelation 8, verses 1 through 6, and that part of this scene is that the prayers that are ascending to Christ in his intercession here come up to him, and they're, they're mixed and then they're going to be responded to when the, the fire is thrown down. So they're mixed with incense. On the next page, the incense ascending with the prayers of Israel represent the merits and intercession of Christ. His perfect righteousness, which through faith is imputed to his people, and which can alone make the worship of sinful beings acceptable. To God. Before the veil of the most holy place was an altar of perpetual intercession, before the holy, an altar of continual atonement. By blood and by incense, God was to be approached. Symbols pointing to the great mediator through whom sinners may approach Jehovah, and through whom alone mercy and salvation can be granted to the repentant, believing soul. So the prayers come up, they're mixed with the, the um, incense, and then there's uh, a center that is filled with fire. Okay, so let's, we've read this quote earlier, you may not remember it, let's identify what the fire is. Um, and I'm going to cut in the middle, in the middle of this paragraph under, from Ye Shall Receive Power 178. The holy fire from God is to be used with our offerings. The true altar is Christ, and the true fire is the Holy Spirit. The center is filled with the Holy Spirit, and how is the Holy Spirit conveyed to us? comes down through the pipes, and it comes down to the pipes as 
Golden oil, and the golden oil is messages, the communications that God sends to us. And if we don't receive those messages, then God is dishonored. Amen. So we're factoring all this in. And what I'm suggesting to you, I haven't demonstrated it. In this passage of intercession that's portrayed in the first six verses of Revelation 8, this is about these special times, these special reform movements. This is about time periods when God is accomplished. And the sealing of his people, the opening of the seventh seal, is marking when his people are sealed. And when the seventh seal was opened in the Millerite history, Jamal did an excellent job of showing that from 1840 to 1844 that this is an illustration of the latter reign at the end of the world. It's an illustration of Pentecost. It's an illustration of the sealing of God's people. 1840 to 44 is a type of the sealing, okay? And the what seals God's people in those time periods is the outpouring of the Spirit. So Underneath that quote from Hebrews 12.29, our God is a consuming fire. And in the same passage, it says the true altar is Christ. The altar where the fire is taken from that's put into the center is Christ. And from the introduction to the great controversy, page 7, it says, Yet the fact that God has revealed his will to men through his word has not rendered needless the continued presence and guiding of the Holy Spirit. On the contrary, the Spirit was promised by our Savior to open the Word to His servants to illuminate and apply its teachings. And since it was the Spirit of God that inspired the Bible, it is impossible that the teachings of the Spirit should ever be contrary to that Word. And remember, one of the illustrations that we use for this, that we talked about early on, is the fire that came down of heaven in the story of Elijah. It illuminated the altar, and the altar was made up of 12 stones, and those 12 stones represent the 144,000 that represent God's covenant with His people, and it identified the true and the false prophet in the crisis at Carmel. The Holy Spirit is to illuminate Christ. Testimonies to Ministers, page 112. God's Spirit has illuminated every page of Holy Writ, but there are those on whom it makes little impression because it is imperfectly understood. When the shaking comes by the introduction of false theories, these surface readers, anchored nowhere, are like shifting sand. They slide into any position to suit the tenor of their feelings of bitterness. When did this shaking begin? It began at the Garden of Eden, if you want to be technical. That's when the arguments on the planet Earth began. So there's always been a shaking. Right? But we know in Adventism there are specific shakings that have, are, are marked in prophetic history. And I would submit to you that the shaking that is being primarily dealt with, the shaking in Adventism, begins here in 2001, in the latter rain, begins to sprinkle. This is the shaking of all shakings in Adventism. This is where those that are going to stay in are stay in, and those that are going to be shaken out are shaken out. This is the shaking process. Why do I say that? Because from 1840 to 1844, that's what happened in the Miller Island. The coal that's taken from the altar in the intercessory scene, the live coal is a symbol of purification. If it touches the lips, no impure word will fall from them. The live coal also symbolizes the potency of the efforts of the servants of the Lord. So as the fire is taken from the coal, the Holy Spirit is taken from the coal, put into the censer, poured into the, the golden pipes that bring the golden oil down to us, and we receive it through the messages of God's Word. If received correctly, it produces a purification process in God's people, while also illuminating Christ as He brings His character to view for all those that are this is, this is the, the symbolism that you can find there in this intercessory scene. Fire. I'm still dealing with fire. 
and desire of ages. I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, said John, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He should baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The prophet Isaiah had declared that the Lord would cleanse his people from their iniquities, purify them by the spirit of the judgment and the spirit of burning. The word of the Lord to Israel was, I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin to sin wherever found. Our God is a consuming fire. To sin wherever found. Our God is a consuming fire. I want to make this point. That's why I repeated this. As he's pouring out this fire from the altar to those that receive it, it's a purifying, empowering fire. But to those of us that don't receive it, our God is a consuming fire and he consumes sin. At the same time that he's pouring out a blessing, it is a curse to those. Is that his wrath? Pardon me? Is that his wrath? What we would call his wrath? What would someone call his wrath? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the part that I'm emphasizing now, I don't have a problem calling it his wrath. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it his wrath. I would mark it because I, I want to be clear about God's wrath being the seven last plague, but I understand what you're saying. <coughs> as long as we understand that if I receive that wrath, wrath it's because I brought it upon myself. I'm refusing to see the light. Um, in all who submit to his power, the Spirit, in all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it. Then the glory of God, which destroys sin, must destroy them. Jacob, after his night of wrestling with the angel, exclaimed, I have seen God's face face to face, and my life is preserved. Jacob had been guilty of great sin in his conduct toward Esau. But he had repented. His transgression had been forgiven and his sin purged. Therefore, he could endure the revelation of God's presence. But wherever men came before God while willfully cherishing evil, they were destroyed. At the second advent of Christ, the wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. The light of the glory of God, which imparts light to the righteous, will slay the wicked. But what I'm saying here is in this intercessory sin, which is identifying the sealing of God's people, that is accomplished when God's people pray for this to be accomplished, when we realize that we're in Laodicea, and it's the condition of Seventh-day Adventist Church nowhere comes close to what we would expect with God's church at the end of the world and we start sighing and crying for the abominations that are taking place in the world and in the church and we lift our prayers to the Lord then he promises to take this work into his own hands and pour his spirit out and as he does so it divides God's people identifies Two classes of God's people within the church. This is the everlasting gospel. This was what was accomplished in the Millerite history, which was a symbol of the sealing of God's people. Dearly, Romans 12, 19 and 20, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, Feed him, if he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. The coals of fire are a blessing. They're a blessing. But if they're not received correctly, they're a curse. Okay, the, um, one of the components that takes place in this intercessory scene is that there are seven angels that are standing before God and to them are given seven trumpets. Well, I'm not I'm gonna pass over that. I didn't I didn't plan to have time to explain that in detail. I was gonna to touch on it a little bit and then move beyond it because of time because I want to get to the punchline of all this and you know, and if we want to get back to it afterwards, so be it. Silence in heaven, as I said, I'm not too <clears throat> Uh, dogmatic in my understanding about this, but what I have noted here for you are some passages that at, all, at the, the important movements of Christ's intercessory work, such as the cross, the day of atonement, uh, 
his the close of probation, his second coming, and these important movements, it has been marked that there's silence in heaven. And I stand for correction on this. I'm not trying to teach this dogmatically, but what it seems to me is that at these important movements at the cross, they are so important that those people that understand spiritual things, the angels in heaven, they can silent and watch. Amen. They understand what happened when Christ moved into the most holy place on October 22nd. They were silent. They, were they understand what it means when he moves into the process of judging the living. Amen. Is that an earthly half hour you're thinking? I'm not dealing with a half hour. I'm not dealing with a half hour. Um, <laughs> I, I, we deal with the half hour, but uh, I, I, we, I got I got a big enough uh, piece of pie that we're, I'm going to try feeding you here without going into half hour. Right? But I like I like that discussion, but we're not going to this time. Forgive me. Um, so you see some quotes on the the um, the silence in heaven. Let's go to the last page of our notes, and we have much to say. Uh, we're going to look at these, but we're going to start doing some things. We're on page one forty-eight. <clears throat> Influences are to be set in motion that will proclaim to the world the first, second, and third angel's message. The time has come of which John writes, The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. The ark of his testament, which this ark contains, the two tables of stone upon which are written with the finger of God the Ten Commandments, the ark is a symbol of the presence of God. In clear, steady rays, the light shines from it to the world. The time has come when the law of God is to be proclaimed with a strong, decided utterances. The world is to be warned, and I beseech those who know the truth to, to do all in their power to sound the warning. Prepare to meet thy God. The temple of God was opened in heaven in answer to the prayers of his people. And by terrible things and righteousness he will reveal his power. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, David said, for they have made void their law, thy law. Thy they have made void thy law, he says, that well nigh universal scorn thrown on God's law did not change his sentiments in regard to it. Therefore, I love thy commandments, and thy gold, yea, but fine gold. Brothers and sisters, as we see the law of God just about to be overturned, this is the time period when our prayers are to be ascended to heaven. And when our prayers are ascended to heaven in this intercessory time period, we know that this is the time period of the latter rain, so we can understand that this is the time that the Lord is going to accomplish this intercessory work that I'm suggesting to you is represented by the opening of the seventh seal. We're going to try taking that up now. We put a few components in place, and I told you out front there's five or six things in Revelation 8, verses 1 through 6 that need, need to be understood, and I'm not going to touch on them all. I'm going to try touching them on one. Okay? And if we have time, I might get some commentary on the trumpets. Because that's, that's very interesting, too. But you'll see in the, from Prophets and Kings, page 714. You there? We, we looked at this last night. Today the Church of God is free to carry forward the, to the completion the divine plan for the salvation of the lost race. For many centuries, God's people suffered the restriction of their liberties. And then she goes on to talk about the 1260 years of papal rule. In the last sentence, after speaking about the 1260 years, she says, God's church on earth was as verily in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during their period of exile. Okay. So what I'm seeing here, this is ancient Israel. This is the Christian church. This is the 70 years captivity. But it lines up with the 1260 years of papal rule. You see that in that quote? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
this is So this is for ancient Israel. But we know that um, Ephesus back here <coughs> Ephesus is the beginning of the Christian church. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is the Christian church. But Ephesus is also the end of ancient Israel. Right? This is where Stephen Stone and Israel's divorce of God as God's people. Where they removed the diadem. They removed the diadem. And, but we know that the end of ancient Israel is identical to the beginning. Okay, the story of Moses is the beginning of ancient Israel. This is where God entered into a covenant with ancient Israel at Sinai after he brought them out of captivity, and that all the waymarks in the story of the Egyptian deliverance line up with the waymarks of Christ's time period. Whether it's the cross, Passover, Pentecost, Pentecost, disappointment, disappointment, work of the enemies, reformer, they're all there, time of the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, the history of Moses is Ephesus. We talked about it last time. Pergamos. Is, is, is a cause and an effect. It was the compromise of ancient Israel that took them into the captivity of Thyatira. <coughs> it was the compromise of the Christian church that took them into the captivity of Thyatira. Right? Okay. So, we know that here, this history here, is the, the first city. This is the second. This is the third. And this is the fourth. Correct? The Ephesus is the first city. Smyrna is the second city. Pergamus is the third city. Thyatira is the fourth city. Amen. So, this is the first seal for ancient Israel. This is the second. This is the third. And this is the fourth. Okay, okay let's, let's try to make sure that we're on the same page. In the fifth seal, which I'm not suggesting in sequential history, I, I took, took some time to say that these are truths, but in the fifth seal, we have the martyrs raising a question. What's their question? How long? How long? How long? Okay. Now, what what the question is about is how long are you till you judge the papacy for the martyrdom of those that were martyred during the Dark Ages? But it's a question about when you're going to punish the papacy, brothers and sisters. The reason that Sister White places the fifth seal down here at the end of the world. She places it down here in the time period of Laodicea. Because that's where we're at, right? Laodicea. Mm -hmm. And this is where the fourth angel's message of Revelation 18 comes. Because it's in this time period of Laodicea when this other group of martyrs is going to be made up as the final bloodbath that is brought about by the papacy. It tells these, these martyrs, wait until the group that's going to die as you die is made up, and that takes place down here in Laodicea, at the fourth angel of Revelation 18. And that's why Sister White takes a fifth seal, and she places it right down here. So, go with me if you would to Zechariah. And, it, and it's in this time period of Revelation 18. It's in the time period of Revelation 18. Let me make one more point. When Babylon is being punished in Revelation 18, Babylon is fallen, and the martyrdom, the martyrs that are being made up, the second group of martyrs, are you with me? During that history, Christ is building his temple. Okay? Because he built the temple 
um, on the three creeds, but that reform movement paralleled the reform movement of Christ, where Christ said, destroy this temple, and in three days it will raise it up. And in the history of the Christ, the temple was built from 1798 to 1844. So one of the things that these reform movements are identifying upon the testimony of two or three um, of things established, when the final reform movement of the 144,000 takes place, Jerusalem is going to be chosen. It's going to be rebuilt. It's going to be reestablished. Now, turn to Zechariah chapter 1. Let's start in verse 7. Upon the 420th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Sebat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Enoch, the prophet, saying, verse 8, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses, speckled horses, and white horses. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. The angel says, I'm going to show you what these horses are. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom, walk, whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro in, through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Whatever these horses represent, what they accomplish is they bring the earth to rest. Do you see that? Okay. So go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah what? 14. Isaiah 14, verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel. Are you there in verse 1? Amen. Okay, keep your finger there. Put your finger right there and go back to Zechariah. I want to make one more point. Keep your finger in Isaiah 14. Go back to Zechariah, verse 1. I know sometimes... Zechariah is a little bit hard to find, but it should be. So it's okay. We're going to be forced to find this. Is it one, one? Zechariah chapter 1. I want you to see um, something here. In verse uh, 14 of Zechariah 1, it says, So the angel that communed with me said unto me, cried out, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, but I was a little displeased that they, yet they helped forward, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built upon it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon it. Cry, Yet saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Okay. Yet choose Jerusalem. Now go back to Isaiah 14, because I want you to understand, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. They're all telling the same story. And in the context of Zechariah 1, it's about choosing Jerusalem. And Isaiah 14, verse 1, starts by saying, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel. These are parallel passages. And what we're coming to Isaiah 14 for is because we want to understand what it means that these horses brought rest to the earth. Okay? Okay? For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob and the people shall take them and shall bring them to their place and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids and they shall take them captives who captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressors in captivity Verse 3, and it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from thy hard bondage wherein thou was made to serve. The earth is given rest 
at the end of a captivity. When the captivity is over, the earth is at rest. Go back to Zechariah. Chapter 1. After or during? At the conclusion. It will come to pass when the Lord will have given you rest. Jeremiah, in 70 years, the land enjoyed their Sabbaths. Yeah, but I, that's the land. I'm talking about the rest of the, of the people. Okay. Because Zechariah 1 is at the conclusion of these 70 years. Okay, let's, let's look at verse 11 again. Starting verse 11 in Zechariah, Zechariah 1. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth is still and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these seventy years? This is taking place at the end of the seventy years has had indignation. The end of the 70 years, and this is the 70 years right here, right? At the end of the 70 years, Zechariah has seen a vision with horses that have walked to and fro on the earth and have brought the earth to rest. It's just simply marking that, that the work of these horses is finished right here and the ca- at the end of the captivity. The end of the captivity is marked by the earth being at rest, okay? Now, now, um, notice verse 12 one more time. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long, how long? How long until you rebuild Jerusalem? And when Jerusalem gets rebuilt, Babylon is judged. The how long of Zechariah is the how long of the altar goes below the altar. And it's marking the fifth seal for ancient Israel. Okay? Didn't you need to move that breath down there back in the altar? Yeah, you can, but I'm just trying to mark the fish so you can do a lot with this. We're just taking taking what we need to take to make our point. Um, so, there is going to be, brothers and sisters, a Laodicea for ancient Israel, right? But, remember, how do we do this? Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just abbreviate that rather than get it all cluttered. There should be a Philadelphia for ancient Israel too. And what would be a Philadelphia for ancient Israel? Okay, and here's here's one that you have to can have to apply a little bit of your student of prophecy that you've learned this week. It's easy to see. It's easy to see. And it's the reason I have this line up here, all right? In these reform movements, okay? What comes after the third way mark? Disappointment, right here. And then what what follows? A word, a word is given to to God's people. And then what? Back life. Okay. So if we mark this as the time of Christ, or if we look at the reform movement of the time of Christ, we know that that's Ephesus for the Christian church. That period, the beginning of the Christian church is, is the complete reform movement here. Okay? But we know that the beginning of the church, Christian church is down here at the end of ancient Israel. And what I want you to see in here is this reform movement of Christ, it covers this period. Philadelphia for ancient Israel is the time of the end, the birth of Christ, then the message of John the Baptist, then the enemies resist the work, and then the cross. But when the disciples go fishing, fishing, that turns 
this history of ancient Israel into the Okay. Now, now why, why would you see that? Why would you see that? Because it's there. But because in this time period of Laodicea, we have the disappointment, the work, the backslidden condition, thus Laodicea starts. Then we then we have the number one. The disciples have to put away their differences in Laodicea. And then we have the number four, which is Pentecost. And then this number three, the stoning of Stephen. Did I lose you? No. Okay. Yeah. This is a tricky one. All right. This is a tricky one. But it, the first thing you need to tell yourself is when I just ask you, did I lose you? That there were several brothers and sisters in here that said no. So, so those of you that aren't seeing it first time through, it can be solved. You can recognize it. So just relax. Okay, relax. It's not that hard. This history here of ancient Israel, when the Christian church is being raised up, that's Ephesus. Okay? And it includes Pentecost. Ephesus doesn't quit being Ephesus until after the year 100, until the church begins to suffer persecution. All right? Down in, down in this history. I'm not suggesting that Ephesus in the Christian church ends before Pentecost. It doesn't. Ephesus for the Christian church goes beyond Pentecost. But when you take that and mark that, and you come down here to the end of ancient Israel, at the end of ancient Israel, you have this complete history of Christ, and you have in that history both Philadelphia and Laodicea illustrated from ancient Israel. And the way that you mark the dividing line between Philadelphia and Laodicea is the point where they go back into the backslidden condition. That's an easy one to see. That's, that's when we become Laodicea. For in the history of Christ, it's when the disciples went fishing, which was prior to Pentecost. And the reason that I want you to see this is for this reason. In Adventism, we know that in the Millerite history, in 1798, there began to be an increase of knowledge. And by the time they got to 1844, let me mark it, 1798, the line of the tribe of Judah begins to unseal the book. One seal, two seal, three seal, four seal, five seal, six seal, and on October 22nd, 1844, the seventh seal is open. Okay. The little book's fully opened in this history. The seventh seal's been opened, and the seventh seal is marking this sacred history of the Millerites that illustrate the sealing of God's people. Because it doesn't simply illustrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It does. But the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is an illustration of the sealing of God's people. So when you get to the end of the Millerite history, you've reached the opening of the seventh seal, and the opening of the seventh seal is the sealing that is illustrated from 1840 to 1844 in the history of the Millerites. Understand that? Do you understand that? Therefore, in the history of ancient Israel, back here in Moses, the first seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal, fifth seal, Philadelphia is the sixth seal. In the history of Laodicea for ancient Israel, Christ opens the seventh seal. When does he do it? In actual history, when does he do it? At Pentecost. Right? And where do we see Christ opening the seventh, the book sealed with seven seals? In heaven, in Revelation 4 and 5, what does that illustrate? What history? Be more specific. He ascended from the cross to the holy place at the inauguration, which we call Pentecost. At Pentecost, Christ opened the seventh seal for ancient Israel. And when he opens the seventh seal, 
he is marking when he seals his people. Was, was God's people sealed at Pentecost? Amen. Yeah, it's great controversy. Six of them, Sister White compares the Advent movement of 1840 to 44 with Pentecost while also comparing it to the history of um, the mighty angel of Revelation 1827. When Christ opens the seventh seal, it's marking when his people are sealed. And the seventh seal was opened for ancient Israel in Laodicea at Pentecost. And it is portrayed for us in Revelation chapter 5 as Christ opens the seal. That's why we need to understand that the opening of the seventh seal is not progressive history. It's identifying the truth that Christ opened the seventh seal for ancient Israel here and sealed his people. And he opened the seventh seal for the Millerites in 1840 to 44, sealing the Millerites. But as soon as that happened, this is the one that will blow your mind, perhaps. As soon as that happened, John was told, seal up for the seven hundred over in my Brothers and sisters, I still the seven seals for the 144,000. And it's the seven. That history is repeated. In 1989, in the history of the 144,000, this history is going to be repeated when the seventh seal, this is this is this month, is opened in the history of the 144,000. The seven seals have been represented by the seven thunders. And the seven thunders were what? In verse 4. They were sealed up. But at the end of the world, they are unsealed. How many of them are there? Five or eight? Seven. There are seven thunders. And this increase of knowledge that begins in 1989, the advancing glory of this knowledge reaches its perfection when Christ is once again opening the seventh seal. Okay? Only here, it's been sealed up. And it, at when it was sealed up, it was symbolically identified as seven thunders. The fact that Christ is opening the seven thunders is identifying his work in bringing these truths to the surface, the fact that we are recognizing this now, this testimony that he's doing it now. <laughs> and what is it? It's the latter rain. And what is the latter rain? It's the messages that he sends. And what are the messages? It's his word. It's, it's the still small voice of the Bible and spirit prophecy that he's opening up. And how does he seal God's people with this? Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And what does he do in this work of opening the seven thunders, the seven seals to the 144,000? What he does is he recre recreates us into his own image, right? And how does he do that? He does it through his word. And his word is his creative word, is it not? Amen. And when he seals us, when he opens the seven thunders and he seals us in this history, what is the sign that we are sealed? Pardon me? The Sabbath? The Sabbath? I thought I thought some I heard someone say that I again, the, the, mystery. the end from the beginning. Is it his creative power that recreates his character in us at the end of time? Yes. Is it that? Is yes. his recreative yes. power? Is his recreative power here at the end any different than his creative power in the beginning? No. And what was his creative power at the beginning? The mystery of Godliness. The light he created God. the earth in seven days. Was it seven days? Six days. He created the earth in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested 
was the rest represent? The refreshing, the latter rain. He's portrayed to end from the beginning. He's recreating himself in the 144,000 as he opens the seventh seal, as he opens the seven thunders. And his recreated process is identical to the beginning when he created the heaven and earth in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested to identify and acknowledge his creative power, which is the Sabbath, which is the rest, which is the refreshing, and the fact that he has opened this truth up at this time, brothers and sisters, is telling us that the Sunday law is on the verge of taking place. The seven thunders are the seven seals that were opened for the pioneers, and it's the seven seals that were opened for ancient Israel. And it's the seven days of creation. Yeah. Oh, there's a grass. It's a lot of grass. It's there. Yes. Let's Christian Church. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together over this period of time that we consider your prophetic word. We understand that you accomplish your work in your people through unsealing prophetic truth, and that the truth is a testing process that produces two classes of worshippers among, worshippers among your people. It's easy to see that this process is well underway, and we wish to be among those that parallel those 50 millerites that entered into the most holy place experience with you. But there's many temptations, many besetting sins and struggles that are out there for us. And this message is so powerful and so profound that it's hard to, to grasp it all. It's hard to know what to do with it when we do understand it. We ask you to give us grace and mercy to, to work through these things we've heard this week, to test them, bring them into our understanding and bring our life into agreement with them. But if we should find that they are wrong, it's best. Give us the courage to, to demonstrate that, reject it. Mm-hmm. We, have to, we have to test these things on our own personal uh, time and effort in order to make them our own. I ask that you put burden on every heart to do that. Mm-hmm. Let's hear these things. But Heavenly Father, it appears now that you're opening the truth that is agreeing with all these other truths that you are now in the process of accomplishing your accessory work. Is represented by this removing of the seventh seal, bringing this light fully and completely to the minds of your people in order to accomplish a recreation of yourself within us. We ask that you go ahead and finish this work and give us the courage to, to enter into that experience with you. We thank you for these huge short days we've had here. As we begin to part ways, we ask for travel and mercies to take us home safely. We ask the blessing upon the materials that have been recorded here that as they go off from this place, those that hear them, study them, we will understand the same important truths that we understand at this time. In Jesus' name. Mm-hmm.